Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! My boss was brought up in a household where the solution to being cold is putting another jumper on to the extent the inside of the windows used to freeze. Lord knows how many times I have heard that story. Unfortunately, instead of reveling in the marvel that is central heating, my boss feels it necessary to impose the same draconian rules trade from the 18th century on all of us in the, in the office. In a word, it gets damn cold at work. For context, I work in a converted barn which is both poorly insulated and has a tall vaulted roof. This means any heat dissipates upwards and the building generally needs a lot of heat to stay comfortable. It's not uncommon to sit indoors wearing my small down jacket and thermal base layers to keep warm. If I was working outside, I could accept this, but in an office environment, it is unnecessary. To make matters worse, I suffer from rain odds, which has been getting worse for the last few years. My condition makes it really rather miserable to sit at work for 8 hours with numb fingers and toes. Well, because of the lack of proper heating in the middle of winter. I'm a long-standing employee, but in all my time working for that company, there has always been another colleague with a far more vocal opinion on how warm the office should be. For the last few years, for instance, a colleague of mine would make a big parade about cranking the heating up to 24 Celsius multiple times a day. This resulted in a daily tit-for-tat between my colleague and boss. Typically, my boss would see the thermostat, exclaim it's too hot, and switch the boiler off at the mains. No heat. I tried in vain to convince my colleague to leave the heating at reasonable level, say 19, 20. As I was certain my boss was unable to actually tell the heating was set higher than his preferred 15 Celsius unless he could visually see the stat set higher. I was ignored. The tit for tat continued, and so did the cold. Roll forward a few years, I am now the only person left in the office other than my boss, his son, and an administrator who works part-time. The temperature has started to drop and the cold has been drawing in. The heating was switched on on Monday this week, and like clockwork said bang on 15 Celsius. I decided enough was enough and sat down with my boss to discuss the heating. I explained how cold temperatures affect my Raynaud's and asked if he would be willing to increase the thermostat. Surprisingly, my boss was pretty compassionate and promised to increase the heating starting the very next day. True to his word, my boss did increase the thermostat by one effing degree. Apparently, 16 Celsius was his limit. To say I was livid was an understatement, but more disheartening was looking towards another winter shivering in my keyboard. I couldn't stand the thought, so I decided to take matters into my own hands. Two really important bits of information popped into my head that morning that formed the perfect plot in an instant. The thermostat was old school. Analog, not digital. My boss and his son were out at a meeting for the whole afternoon, and the admin wasn't due in at all. At lunchtime, I took it upon myself to research the model of thermostat. I found an archived manual online, page 3, calibration. I couldn't believe how simple it was to adjust the unit. There was one screw to remove the outer casing, which exposed the dial. The dial then simply lifts off the spindle, and is rotated and reinserted onto the spindle to calibrate the unit. Armed with my Swiss army knife once I was alone in the office, I got to work. Disassembling the unit, I rotated the spindle clockwise by 4 degrees. So now, when set at 16 Celsius, the thermostat would actually measure 20 Celsius. I replaced the casing and using a relative humidity meter we use for work, I tested the switching point to that stat. The office measured at 16.2 Celsius. And the stack clicked on around 12 Celsius. Hearing the boiler fire in the kitchen gave me the biggest grin I have had in ages. That was on Tuesday. The remainder of the week has been glorious. For the first time in 8 years, the office is actually at a constant comfortable temperature. 
I have been waiting to post this in line with the rules as no fallout had occurred. However, this afternoon my boss asked if I was warm enough, again, unusually compassionate. While I felt kinda bad to go behind his back, it does give me scoop to increase the heating even more when it starts getting really cold in the next few months. I was also pretty ecstatic as it proved the hunch I have had for years. My boss had no idea if the heating is set warmer, other than the number shown on that stat. So, an all-out win for my bit of malicious compliance. Saw another post that was kind of similar to this. Figured I'd share my story too. In 2019, my wife and I welcomed our first child into the world. And as a baby shower gift, my father, who lives on the other side of the country, wanted to buy us a crib. Obviously, the easiest way to do this was to order from Amazon. So that is what he did. Total came out to something like $650 plus free shipping. Now, my wife and I were the ones to select which crib we wanted. And my father had no issue with the price. My dad orders it from his account shipped to my address. So the crib shows up. They dropped it at the base of our driveway. But we have about 15 steps up to our front door. That box is heavy, probably handy of 500 pounds. And it's just me and my pregnant wife. So me. But we get it in and we spend the day building it and go on with our lives. But as ads does what ads does, my phone was bombarded with ads for crips, including the one my father just bought us less than two weeks ago. Surprise, surprise, it's gone on sale for $430. So I contact Amazon, let them know what's going on and ask if they have a 30-day price guarantee. I figured there was no reason to tell my dad he could have saved $220 if he wasn't able to get the money back. Now because it was over $200, they couldn't just do a refund, but said we could return the crib and order a new one. Unfortunately, we've already built the crib and cannot return it. So they told us, order a new one. But when that crib comes in, return the old one and get the refund. I made sure to ask about return shipping and they said that it will be covered as the item has free shipping. And I saved the transcript of our conversation. So that's what we started to do. I contacted my dad. He puts a new order in and we wait for the box to arrive. Similar situation. A box was left at the edge of my driveway, but this time the weather was pretty crabby and the box got ruined. I took photos of it sitting at the curb and then moved it inside. I let my dad know and he contacts Amazon and then gets an email providing the return address and instructions on how to return, including a plank affix postage here spot on a label. Back to talking to Amazon support and they are very sorry and look into it. Apparently shipping on this crib is like $350. I am sitting there with two crips and prove that Amazon said they will cover the return shipping. So like one thousand and fifty dollars in shipping. All for what amounts to a four hundred and thirty dollar crib. So they told us to keep it and refunded the original purchase of six hundred and fifty dollars. My sister lived a few hours from me and her and her husband were looking at starting to try for kids. So she got herself a crib as a baby shower gift. From my dad too. I was out shopping at the local mall minding my own business when I saw her. A woman, accompanied by a child, walking straight towards me. I knew what she was going to say before she even opened her mouth. You see, I live in a state where open carry is legal and I choose to exercise that right for my own safety. I've been through an incident in the past that has forced me to carry a gun publicly in hopes of preventing such a thing from happening again. I used to be a regular person going about my daily business, but one day, while I was at home with my family, we were the victims of a home invasion. We were robbed, beaten, and left for dead. It was a traumatic experience that left both physical and emotional scars. After that, I decided to arm myself for protection and started to carry my weapon in public. I took classes, obtained my permits, and became proficient in handling my weapon. It gives me a sense of security knowing that I can protect my family and my loved ones if something like that ever happens again. It's important for me to carry my weapon in a safe and responsible manner. I always make sure to follow the laws and regulations of my state. 
and I never use my weapon in a reckless and irresponsible way. I understand that some people may not agree with my choice, but it's a personal decision that I make for my safety and the safety of my family. As she approached me, the woman, Karen, said, Excuse me, sir, can my son see your gun? He's interested in becoming a cop in the future. He wants to see one up close. I replied politely, I understand your son's interest in law enforcement and it's commendable that he wants to pursue that career path. But I'm sorry, I cannot let him see my gun. It's not safe for him or anyone else to handle a weapon without proper training and safety precautions. Handing a firearm to someone without proper training can lead to accidents and injuries. It's important that we prioritize safety above all else. I also added, I will be happy to recommend some resources for your son to learn about gun safety and handling if he's interested. But I'm afraid I can't let him handle my weapon. It's not only illegal, but also not responsible. Karen seemed not to understand or accept my explanation, and she started to raise her voice and make demands. But I stood my ground and repeated my explanation politely but firmly. I understood her son's curiosity, but safety must come first. What do you mean it's not safe? You're carrying it around in public, aren't you? Karen retorted, her tone becoming increasingly hostile. I knew that I needed to defuse the situation and explain to her the importance of proper training and safety precautions when handling firearms. So I replied calmly, Ma'am, just because it's legal for me to carry a weapon in public doesn't mean it's safe for anyone to handle it without proper training and precautions. Carrying a weapon in public is a serious responsibility and it's important that I'm properly trained and familiar with my weapon to ensure the safety of myself and those around me. But Karen wouldn't have it. She started to raise her voice. You're going to show my son that gun right now or I will have you arrested. I knew that I had to stand my ground and not compromise on safety. I replied firmly, I'm sorry, but I cannot do that. It's not safe and I'm not comfortable with it. I understand your son's curiosity, but handing a weapon to someone without proper training can lead to accidents and injuries. I know I'm repeating myself, but clearly you need me to repeat things for you. I knew that I'm sort of repeating myself at this point, but I had to be patient. I had to be calm and contained in a situation like this. It's extremely dangerous if you get out of that zone with a gun on your side. I could see that Karen was becoming more agitated and I knew that I needed to end the interaction before it escalated any further. I politely excused myself and walked away, leaving Karen and her child behind. I knew that the situation could have turned much worse. Karen's face turned red with anger and she continued to threaten me. You'll be sorry for this. I'll make sure you never carry a gun again. She spat at me. I could see the hostility and aggression in her eyes and I knew that I needed to be prepared for anything. And that's when she suddenly lunged at me, trying to snatch my gun out of its holster. I was caught off guard but I quickly regained my composure and acted fast. I grabbed her wrist, twisted it and, with a firm grip, I called out for someone to dial 911. I knew that I needed to control the situation and prevent her from getting her hands on my weapon. But just as the manager came running towards us, he shouted at me to release Karen right now. Let her go, what are you doing? From an outside point of view, it doesn't look good. He was worried about how it would look to others. But I knew that I was doing the right thing. I was protecting myself and others from a potentially dangerous situation. I complied with the manager's request and released Karen, but I kept my guard up, watching her closely. I knew that the situation could escalate at any moment and that I needed to be prepared for anything. And exactly as I thought, Karen wasn't done yet. She was still filled with anger and aggression and she was looking for a way to lash out. She grabbed a glass bottle of milk from a nearby table and charged at me, trying to smash it on my head. I could see the termination in her eyes and I knew that I had to act fast to protect myself. I quickly grabbed her wrist again, this time with the intention of disarming her and preventing her from causing harm. I twisted her arm, trying to make her drop the bottle, but she wouldn't let go. She was still struggling and trying to hit me with the bottle. At that moment, I knew that I had to protect myself by any means necessary, so I headbutted her with the intention of stunning her long enough for her to drop the bottle 
and for me to disarm her. The headbutt was effective and she dropped a bottle, falling unconscious to the ground. I quickly secured the bottle and made sure that it was out of her reach. I waited for the cops to arrive, keeping an eye on Karen to make sure she was safe and didn't wake up and try to attack me. When the police arrived, they immediately took control of the situation and secured the area. They interviewed witnesses and took statements from everyone involved, including me and Karen. They also reviewed the security footage of the incident, which clearly showed Karen initiating the altercation and my actions were in self-defense. Based on the evidence and statements, they arrested Karen for assault and creating a public disturbance. They also took my statement and cleared me of any wrongdoings as I had acted in self-defense. The police officers explained to me that they would have to file a report and that the incident would be forwarded to the district attorney's office for further review. This incident was a clear example of how not to behave in such situations and how dangerous it can be to try to handle someone else's weapon without proper training or permission. It also shows how important it is to always be aware of your surroundings and to be prepared for anything that might happen. It's important to understand that firearms are not toys and should be handled with extreme care and caution, and that every person has a right to defend themselves when they feel threatened. So for Christmas, one year my parents got us season passes for Six Flags. We used those passes often throughout the summer as a family and had an amazing time. It was one of these days that it happened. We waited in line for one of the more popular lines which was at the 45 minute waypoint. This was relatively good for this ride as you can wait for up to an hour and a half at its busiest point. We got into line excited to share this ride with our dad as it's one of the few he can ride as he has a bad back injury that makes just walking around extremely painful at times. As we were in a line laughing and making jokes while watching the little TVs they have at various points in the line when a group of people rudely cuts us and stood in front of us. Our dad has a habit of not letting things slide so we all praised for cover waiting for our dad to go off on these people for cutting us when to our surprise he didn't say anything. With confused looks we turned to our dad wondering why he hadn't told him off and to get behind us. He just looked at us with a look in his eyes saying wait for it. We shrugged it off and continued our wait. We didn't make it too far into the line at this point, so it was still about a 45 minute wait. As we got closer to the front of the line, we got more and more excited waiting to get on a ride with our dad and have a great time. The way the line is set up is before you get into the loading station, there is a two way staircase that has a regular line on one side and a fast pass line on the other. And at the top of the stairs, there are workers making sure the people in the fast pass lane are supposed to be there. This is where my dad strikes. After waiting 45 minutes in line behind the cutters, we stood at the top of the stairs and my dad signaled for a worker's attention. Once he received it, he pointed to the group that had cut us and calmly stated that they had cut us at the beginning of the line. The worker then politely told the group they would need to leave the line and go back to the beginning. They were pissed, but they followed the instructions and left the line. The worker thanked my father for informing them and suddenly pieces pushed into place in our mind. Our dad purposely waited until the very last minute to make them have to wait another 45 minutes, plus more time as the line was longer now than it was later in a day. More people arrived. I couldn't help but laugh as I watched them walk out of the line and back towards the beginning and just hope that they learned or listened not to cut after that. This sub has got me through a lot of boredom and has provided me with hours of entertainment. I figure it's my turn to tell my revenge story. So it's been about 4 years since this happened. I was about 18 at the time working for a security company. There were constant call-offs and no-shows. I have no idea why, but being so young and naive, I was constantly working 16 hour shifts and not coming home until 8 am. Also, I lived with my father at the time. The time frame of this was around the 4th of July. I finally had a day off and my best friend was back in town for vacation. 
we decided to get together and chip in on some good old American fireworks. To be fair, I have had nothing but bad experiences with fireworks, so I had no idea how this would be any different. We got home with the fireworks and we laid them all out on the floor. Sparklers, bottle rockets, cakes and roman candles. I say, why don't we mess around with some sparklers since it's still not dark yet? Great idea. We got into my backyard, where it hasn't trained in well over two months, and it's extremely dry. You see the problem here? One of the little sparkies from mine, the my friend Sparkler, made contact with the ground and made two small fires that quickly spread to a large area. It was no use. It was spreading faster than I could spray it. I handed my friend the hose and called 911. It felt like hours was only 4 minutes and the fire was spreading to the neighbor's fence. The neighbor came outside and they were fairly calm to grab their hose and spray down the fence, along with the dead grass in her yard. The fire department shows up finally and I tell my friend, only one of us needs to get in trouble, we should leave. He was reluctant to leave because he felt equally responsible, but I convinced them. I didn't want him to get in trouble and have to drop out of college. My neighbor was super chill about the entire situation at first. I told her that we could talk about replacing the fence and get some quotes to repair it. She was just super grateful that everyone was okay. About two hours after the fire, the arson slash fire investigator came to question me about the fire. I told him the truth. I said I was in the backyard by myself playing with fireworks and accidentally lit the ground on fire. I had gotten off that day without being hit by any charges, I was commended for being honest. Here where it goes downhill very fast. About a week later I got a knock on the door from the neighbor. I opened the door and she handed me two pieces of paper for me to look at. There was a quote for the fence valued at around $4,000 and an estimate for a lawn care valued around $6,000. These were really shady and just typed out on a Microsoft Word document. No logo or company name. She then added, I will also be having you pay my water bill for three months because a new yard will need lots of water. Now the fence this woman had before was raggedy and falling apart. Her yard, dead grass, weeds everywhere never mowed it. Now looking at this paper, she wants a mahogany fence and a brand new backyard with flowers and trimmed hedges. I said, I need to get an estimate myself. This doesn't feel right. She says, remember, you agreed to replace my fence, and a real man keeps promises. I shut the door and called my dad to tell him about what just happened. He flipped the hill out and told me, son, don't you give that a single dime. He gives me the number to his handyman and tells me to take care of it. The next day, I had the guy come out for an estimate, and the neighbor ran outside flailing her arms. I did not give you permission to get an estimate on my fence. Technically, it separates the property line, so it's both our fences. She calls the cops on me for having a contractor, and they ultimately can't do a single thing because I am on my property. He quickly finishes the estimate off at $1,200. I also knew a guy who did lawn care from my time working at the grocery store. He estimated the lawn receding while she was away from the house to be about $800. After I get these estimates, I give copies to the woman and she's having none of it. I don't know these people. I don't want them near my house. They are probably really crabby contractors. I said no, I know them personally. They are really nice people and do great work. She shut the door in my face and I went on my way. I ended up working a 16-hour shift that night and got home at 8 a.m. This woman came knocking on my door at 9 a.m. and demanded I speak to her. I explained I would really love to do this, but I just got home and I have to be back at work in less than 5 hours. I need to sleep. She goes, what kind of lazy A-hat sleeps in until 2 p.m.? At this point, I had about lost it and told her you can either accept my $2,000 for my quotes or kiss my A and get nothing. She stood there for a while with her mouth gaped open. But she accepted my offer and planned to meet Dan at the notary the next morning. I spent that night after I got off work writing a contract and gathering the $2,000 in cash. The next morning I wake up and grab this contract to meet Dan at the notary. I was thrilled to be finally done with this prod and never speak to her again. 
I waited for her for over three hours and she didn't show up. I get a call from her saying I'm sorry that two thousand dollars isn't enough. I'm having my guy start work on this project and you will be paying me full price. Oh really? After that, I did not say a single word to her. And I watched her for a few months as these guys turned her backyard into oasis, complete with a small pond, brand new sod and flowers, the whole nine yards. Come to find out she had plans to remodel these things for a long time. I was just waiting for the opportunity to go through with it. Also, at this time, she used her remodel funds to go on a trip to Hawaii. You know how I found out about this? She was bragging about it on the neighborhood Facebook group and didn't know that I was in it. I have a different Facebook name than my real name. Are you ready for revenge? Now, four months after the fire and all the remodels, I got served papers to go to court for $10,300. At 18 years old, I'm having to hire a lawyer to work my case. When we finally do get into court, I lay everything out. The quotes, being harassed multiple times, not showing up after agreeing to a deal, not wanting me to get my own quotes, required by law by the way, and her bragging about screwing me out of money and I have proof of all this. The judge looked at her and said, ma'am, with all due respect, you're out of your damn mind. Not only did this young man tell the truth of what happened, he offered to pay you more than he was supposed to. Your lawn was already dead before the fire occurred, therefore he's only responsible for the fence of $1,200. I will also deduct from this his lawyer fees, $800. So I burned this woman's fence down and all I'm having to give her is $400. Well, cool. She took a huge financial loss from this. Not sure how much the Hawaii trip cost her, but she was in serious debt. She ended up having to sell the house because of it and moved into a smaller house. Haven't heard anything from her since. Edit. I wanted to clear a few things up. I am not saying that I do not feel bad for burning down my neighbor's fence. I felt really bad about it and wished we could have handled it more severely. I would have been happy to meet in the middle or get multiple quotes. To this day I still do not use fireworks because we could have really hurt someone. What I have learned through this though is it's best to take responsibility for your actions from the gate. The fire investigator had seen the leftover fireworks near the area of the fire and said he would have slapped cuffs on me and I would be in jail for arson if I would have given him any other answer. I was not criminally charged and the incident was deemed an accidental fire. Thank you to the people in the comments giving me information about how much a fence actually costs. I've never had to purchase a fence before so I had just believed what the contractor had told me was that a second thought. I recently had a holiday book to Mexico, which at the time of booking, early 2020, came to around 2,200 pounds for two people for two weeks. We felt pretty fortunate to have been able to get that at that sort of price. Anyway, COVID happened, and as you can imagine, the holiday we booked with Tui, British holiday slash travel agent, was postponed. Feeling a little anxious to go abroad even when restrictions were lifted, my partner and I decided we wanted to cancel and rebook at another time. Truth be told, we could have also benefited quite a lot with having some of that money back. I called him to cancel after a rather lengthy hold to get through to them to be told sorry. If you want to cancel, you will lose £2,100 of the £2,200 that you paid. However, you can make a free of charge amendment and you or we will pay the difference. So if your new holiday is cheaper, we will refund the difference. Okay, let me speak with my partner and see what we want to do. Malicious compliance begins. I have no interest in postponing my holiday, so I browse their other destinations on the website. I call back the next day. Hi, I'd like to make an amendment to my booking, please. Sure, no problem. Do you have any destination in mind? Yes, I found this rather appealing location in the Canary Islands, which also happens to be your cheapest holiday. Oh, and I want to amend it from two weeks to your minimum stay. Okay, so you will get a refund of £1,750 and your holiday has now been amended. After receiving my refund a few days later, I call them and tell them that I wish to cancel my new bad cheap holiday. 
At this point, I have lost about half of what the bad cheap holiday would have cost. Instead of losing 2,100 pounds, I only ended up losing 280 pounds. Granted, it is not ideal to have lost out on 280 pounds, but I'm sure it's better than losing most of what I paid.